I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Order of the day number one, Committee of Privileges, report relating to matter referred to committee on 23rd of November 1989, consideration of report. The Honourable the Leader of the House. Mr uh, Speaker, I move that one, the House agrees with the finding and recommendations of the committee and calls upon the Honourable Member for Bruce to withdraw the allegation and apologise to the House. <coughs> and two, in the event of the Honourable Member for Bruce not withdrawing and apologising, a motion be moved that the Honourable Member for Bruce be suspended from the services of the House for two sitting days, including today. Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, we have now had some considerable period of time to view both the report of the Committee of Privileges and uh, the minority reports and to study the minutes of the Committee of Privileges. Since uh, that day, that very unfortunate day, back on the 23rd of November, when one of the members of this House had, without due resolution, uh, effectively tabled a series of allegations of a most serious nature. The committee has, of course, not gone into those allegations. They've simply gone into the issue that, uh, of uh, what should have been the state of the honourable member's knowledge as to how he might proceed with those matters. The committee evidently sought to ascertain uh, from the honourable member as to whether or not he, uh, uh, in this case the honourable member for Bruce, as to whether or not he understood what the processes were which uh, would, uh, uh, he would be obliged to follow in order to have such uh, matters considered by the House of uh, Representatives, and quite clearly he should and did understand the processes he ought to have gone through. Now, the Honourable Member for Bruce makes a fetish of a willingness to make bizarre allegations under privilege in this place. If you go back over his record over the years, he at least ought to be as, co as competent as any member of this House in understanding exactly what he ought to be doing in placing matters, bef placing matters before the House. He has made over the years bizarre allegations about the connection of uh, industry leaders, trade union officials, politicians and police to uh, uh, their alleged involvement in drug trafficking when investigated by the AFAP, AFP, but found to be unfounded and based on rumour and conjecture. He has also uh, at various times managed to uh, describe the Prime Minister as being, uh, as being linked to organised crime. He has uh, managed uh, over the years to find uh, spies in all sorts of locations. And whenever order. order. The Honourable Member for New England on a point of order. The Minister might resume his seat. The Leader of the House at the moment is digressing from the content of that report and in that he's criticising the Honourable Member for Bruce for matters that are not pertinent to the report from the Privileges Committee, I'd suggest that it's entirely out of order. Under our standing orders, if a member is to be condemned, they must do so, be done, that must be done by substantive motion. Order. Now, the matters to which the Leader of the House is referring are not in the Privileges Committee report. They're quite outside the matter now order. before the House, and I suggest they're entirely out of order. order. The, the Minister was said that he believed the member for Bruce should be aware of the standing orders and, and was recounting where he believed the member for Bruce should have been aware of the standing orders. To that extent, to that extent I find him relevant, but he should be talking to the, the mat, substantially to the matter before the House. Speaker, I have in fact made the, uh, the points that I wanted to make in that regard, which, as you say, go to the point of whether or not the Honourable Member for Bruce ought to be familiar with the procedures of this House and the way in which matters of uh, allegations of substance are, uh, are made. And in this particular matter, the uh, Member for Hotham was the victim of a two-pronged assault, one in the other place, which we cannot deal with here, and one in this place that went to the very heart of his integrity, as was pointed out in the debate by which this matter was considered by the uh, uh, the Honourable Member for uh, Melbourne Ports. Those allegations, if uh, substantiated on the basis of a resolution in this place, uh, would go very much to the heart of whether or not the Honourable Member for Hotham ought to hold tenure in this place. So they were allegations of a very serious nature. 
and uh, their allegations, I might say, when looking at it, uh, were presented without any substantial proof at all. Now, what is the conclusion? What is the conclusion of the committee? The committee concludes: A. Whilst acting on the basis of information presented to him, the honourable member for Bruce, if of the view that the allegation should have been brought before the House, should also have been alert to the requirement that such a matter ought to be put forwards by means of substantive motion, open to debate, and which would admit of a distinct vote of the House. B. As a matter of urgency, the committee drew attention of all, on, all members to the requirements of the standing orders and practices of the House, which govern the matter of reflections on and charges against members, and c. The great privilege of freedom of speech carries with it a heavy obligation that it be exercised with great care and responsibility, and that the misuse of this privilege in making charges against other persons, whether members or not, could be held by the House to be not only an abuse but a contempt. The member for Mayo. Having regard to the experience of the Honourable Member for Bruce, the committee finds that the Honourable Member has offended against the rules of the House. Accordingly, the committee recommends that the honourable member should, at the first parliamentary opportunity, be required to apologise to the House for a serious breach, and recommends that the House requires him to withdraw the allegation. Hence, the resolution that uh, I have put before the House. Now, that is a serious set of findings, a set of findings in a limited area, not to the substance of what the honourable member for Bruce has had to say, uh, which we, uh, I think, the House would wisely treat like the substance of just about everything. The Honourable Member for Bruce has had to say of this sort of nature in the past, totally unfounded. But by the way in which he handled himself in this place and the processes that this House ought to enforce to ensure the protection of its members, to ensure that all members are effectively capable of exercising the privilege that they have in this place. So the committee narrowed itself to a consideration of how that procedure ought to have been undertaken. Now, I note there are one or two oddball elements of objections to this that come out of the minority report. One of the objections is to the way in which this process uh, arrived before the committee for consideration. Uh, well, all I can say to, in answer to that proposition, the uh, opposition supported the way in which uh, this matter was placed before the, uh, the Privileges Committee when, they, when the matter was, uh, was considered by the House. And the Speaker outlined to the lying to us that there are two ways in which a matter might be placed before the Privileges Committee, one on his recommendation, the other on the recommendation of the House, and any sensible reading of the standing orders would say that to be the case. Now, in terms of whether or not the opportunity was available for the, uh, the member for uh, Bruce to address himself and the issues raised against him at the Privileges Committee, there were some, I believe, five meetings of that committee that went for a substantial period of time over a period of a week. There are plenty of opportunities for the Honourable Member for Bruce to uh, explain himself uh, and to explain the course of action he undertook to that committee. If he feels that he has not had an ample opportunity to explain himself, then that may in some way relate to the way in which he chose to conduct himself at those committee hearings. But that is something for other members, for members of the committee to, uh, to discuss. I was not uh, uh, present at those meetings. What is obvious, though, is to me, and ought to be obvious to every other member of the House, that the processes which ought to have been followed in placing the sorts of allegations made by the Honourable Member for the Bruce before this place simply were not followed by the Honourable Member for Bruce, and that uh, whereas in some circumstances failing to observe the privileges of this place might be excused either by ignorance, if a member happens to be a new member and not used to doing the sort of thing that uh, caused the offence, or because the matters to be considered by uh, in the way in which they are raised to be relatively trivial, uh, that uh, sort of defence does not happen to be available in this case. Firstly, the Honourable Member for Bruce, at least as much as any other member of this House, as he's a long-standing member and a member given to this type of allegation, ought to be thoroughly aware of uh, the processes by which he should place his views before the chamber. And the second is goes to the nature of what was presented. And the nature of what was presented were very serious allegations indeed. And the, the build-up which occurred outside this place and in the other chamber and then finally in this place itself was, a, was by any fair-minded fair uh, view or reading 
by any member of this chamber meant to create, create the impression uh, that the Honourable Member for Hotham was a traitor to this country and as such a person not fit to hold office in this place. So these are, these are serious statements, statements which can only be dealt with in this House order. By, a, uh, by, a, by recourse to the standing orders and recourse to the norms of this House. The Honourable Member for Bruce failed to observe that. Uh, that is all the committee has uh, found on. The committee, of course, did not consider the substance of the allegations. The committee has sensibly, therefore, asked the Honourable Member for Bruce to uh, withdraw and apologise, and that is a, uh, a proposition which all fair-minded members of this House ought to agree with. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Menzies. Um, Mr Speaker, the opposition opposed this motion. And uh, within that uh, context, may I say at the outset that the opposition has been given no notice of this motion whatsoever. One would have thought, uh, especially considering the pompous tone of the speech that we've just heard, with all those lofty references to decency and high principle, Order. one would have thought that at the very least in that context that a motion calling upon a member of this House to withdraw an allegation and apologise and a motion that goes on to say that if he does not, then he is to have that mark against his career, that he is to be suspended for two sitting days, one would have thought that at the very least what the government could have done would be to give the opposition notice of the fact that it intended to move such a serious uh, motion. But no, no such notice has been given. The second instalment of the whole ambush that has coloured this matter from beginning to end has just been visited upon this House. Well, we regard that conduct as utterly reprehensible in every respect, utterly reprehensible. The very least the government could have done would be to give notice of the fact that it intended to move this motion, which is in effect a form of proposed punishment of the Honourable Member for Bruce. Now, Mr Speaker, may I say that this is not a report, the Privileges Report, it is not a report of which this House can be proud. And I would invite all honourable members to read the committee's report, and I venture to say that if they read the evidence, if they read the minutes, if they read the report itself, any fair-minded observer will come to exactly that conclusion, namely that the report is not one of which this House can be proud. In fact, the House should be ashamed of it. The inquiry of which this is the report that's before us now is unsatisfactory from beginning to end and in virtually every respect. It was conducted without any jurisdiction whatsoever. It never clarified exactly what it was inquiry into. It never decided what the real issues were and it was conducted in a manner that was a complete denial of natural justice to the Honourable Member for Bruce. It was in fact a shambles from beginning to end. It was the ultimate, Mr Speaker, of the Star Chamber set up with the clear intention of convicting and then proceeding through an empty charade until its inevitable conclusion. Now let me tell the House why I, why I myself reject the majority report and why in my view the House should be thoroughly dissatisfied with the job done by the committee. First, the committee never made, and this is hard to believe but it's true, never made any formulation of the alleged matter of privilege that was before it and this was despite the fact that the Honourable Member for, Bruce, uh, for Flinders and I asked the committee at the very beginning of the proceedings to do exactly that. You'd think that would be the obvious and first thing to do, to clarify exactly what the committee was inquiring into, but that was never done. Every member of the House who heard the debate when the matter was referred to the Committee of Privileges knew that there was an alleged matter of privilege of some sort to be examined. Some members, I presume, thought that it had been alleged that the Honourable Member for Hotham had infringed his privileges as a member. Other members presumably thought that what was being said was that it was the Honourable Member for Bruce who had broken privilege because of the speech he made in the grievance debate on the 23rd of November. But never, and I repeat, never in the course of the proceedings did the Privileges Committee ever formulate the matter of privilege it was supposed to be inquiring into. The only attempt at such a formulation that was made was when it decided that, and these are its words, the allegation referred to it comprised the address made to the House 
by the member for Bruce on the 23rd of November 1989, recorded at Hansard, page 2804 to 6. Though, as I said in my minority report, that tells us exactly nothing about what head of privilege it said that this matter comes under, and it tells us nothing at all about who was supposed to have committed the breach of privilege. Nor does it tell us how it was thought that there had been a breach of privilege committed by the Honourable Member for Bruce or by anyone else. And so the committee, Mr Speaker, started off in a fog and it remained in a fog for the whole of the inquiry. It almost beggars belief, but the harsh reality is that from the moment of the very reference being made to the committee until today, there has never been any statement of what the alleged breach of privilege is. Not only is this a flaw in the committee's deliberation that existed from the very beginning, but it is doubly bad. And it is doubly bad because the Honourable Member for Bruce was expected to defend himself against a charge where not only did he not know what the charge was, but the committee that was trying him was never able to tell itself what the charge was. And if that is not a travesty of justice, I don't know what is. And so the whole proceedings were flawed from the beginning and, in my view, remain flawed, and that without any more is the reason why the House should reject this motion. Now, the second reason why the inquiry was completely unsatisfactory is uh, that the way in which it conducted its inquiry was a complete and absolute denial of the most elementary principles of justice and fairness to the Honourable Member for Bruce. I have already said, Mr Speaker, that the member was never given uh, the substance of the charge against him. Furthermore, his trial was conducted by a committee whose first failing was its own composition. As is known, the Leader of the House is entitled to nominate a member to the committee. The Leader of the House nominated the Minister for the Arts. Now, what is extraordinary about this is that it was the Minister for the Arts who raised the alleged matter of privilege in the House on the first occasion, and in support of what he said of the Honourable Member for Bruce's remarks that are said to have given rise to the matter of privilege, what the Minister for the Arts said was that they were the vilest of allegations. And not content with this, he added that, I have never heard a more serious allegation than this. Now, we cannot, of course, ask members of the Privileges Committee to be judges in the strictest sense. But what we can ask for and what the rules of natural justice obviously call for is that those who sit on the Privileges Committee, especially when they are to pass judgment on the conduct of one of their colleagues, should come to that committee with an open mind and without prejudice. And it cannot conceivably, by any stretch of the imagination, be said that when a member has contributed to a debate referring a matter to the Committee for Privileges, and in the course of that debate has said that the person to be brought before the committee has been guilty of the vilest of allegations, it cannot, beyond any stretch of the imagination, be said that that member can have an open mind when he comes to the Privileges Committee to exercise his role as a member of that committee. It is just fanciful to suggest that he can. And I have no hesitation at all in saying that the composition of this committee was tainted from the beginning and was utterly illegitimate because of its composition. Now, particularly is this so because the minister was given an opportunity to withdraw from the committee, but declined to do so. And yet, unblushingly, the committee went on and passed judgment on the honourable member for Bruce. And that is the first denial of natural justice. The second clear denial of natural justice is, I believe, simply this, that the honourable member for Bruce asked for the opportunity to obtain legal representation, and he asked for this indulgence on two occasions. And as I've said in my, my minority report, he should have been given a reasonable opportunity to obtain advice before being expected to answer questions and defend himself, and yet he was denied this opportunity. He did not ask for a permanent adjournment, or indeed a lengthy one, and I, for one, would never have granted him one. But I would have granted and proposed, in fact, that he should be granted a reasonable adjournment to enable him to obtain advice and representation. But that was denied, and this was a serious and substantial denial of natural justice. 
But there was a third and far more serious breach of natural justice. The member for Bruce came before us twice. Before he appeared the second time, a resolution had been prepared and circulated, a resolution which in effect found him guilty. So a majority of the committee decided the matter and reached its conclusions before the honourable member for Bruce had been heard, before he had completed his evidence and before he could call his witnesses, which he indicated he wanted to call before the committee. And I regard this as offensive in the extreme. It is nothing more than exactly what it was intended to be, and that was a prejudging of the issue and a prejudging of the honourable member for Bruce. But it gets worse because the majority report does not even say whether a breach of privilege has been committed or not. And in fact, the committee in its deliberations decided that there was no breach of privilege. And that is the basic fact that must be understood about this matter. Before the government tries to hang the member for Bruce, the committee decided, the privileges committee decided, that there was no breach of privilege. And let us get that fact firmly and clearly in our heads. Now, the situation is simply this, uh, Mr Speaker. One would think at the very least that the committee would conclude on the matter of breach of privilege and could say so in its majority report. You would think that it could say whether a breach of privilege had been committed or was not. That was the obligation that the committee had to this House, no more and no less. And yet the report is silent on that most basic of issues. But it is even worse than that because the committee, in fact, as I've said very early in the proceedings, reached the conclusion that it was obvious that there was no breach of privilege. But if that was said, of course, the honourable member for Bruce would be cleared because this was the Privileges Committee and the matter was clearly sent to the committee with the intention of having him examined to see what strength there was in the allegations that had been made, not by him but in the statutory declaration. And when the com committee concluded that there was no breach of privilege, that, Mr Speaker, should have been the end of the matter. But no, the committee has chosen to proceed to deal with the complaint on the basis that there was a breach of the rules of this House. And the House should think very carefully before accepting this report and acting on it by passing this resolution, because it means that the Committee of Privileges is allowed to pass judgment on whether a member has broken the standing orders or the rules of procedure of this House or not. And that was never the function of the Privileges Committee, and it is not a function of the Privileges Committee now. And I would therefore put it to the House very seriously that the Committee has gone widely astray and has absolutely no authority to be passing judgment on whether any member of this House has departed from the rules of the House or not. The final defect of this appallingly slack procedure is that it is very doubtful indeed whether the Honourable Member for Bruce did in fact commit a breach of the standing orders or of the rules of the House. And let me remind the House of exactly what happened in the grievance debate. The Honourable Member tabled a statutory declaration. He did not make allegations, as the Minister has said this morning. And the Honourable Member, uh, the Honourable Member who tabled the statutory declaration, the Honourable Member for Bruce, made no allegations of his own. Now, it goes without saying that the statutory declaration, as Honourable Members will see when they read it, did not say anything of the hysterical sort attributed to him by the Leader of the House or by the Minister for the Arts in his contribution in the earlier debate. Now, the Honourable Member for Bruce asked for leave to table the statutory declaration and was granted it. He was granted leave by a minister who read it. There was no objection made by any member of this House. There was no objection taken by the acting speaker who was in the chair of the mo at the moment at the time. Now, it is said in the report that the honourable member created difficulties for the chair. What difficulties did he create? Is this the situation we're now to be left with as a result of this report and as a result of the motion that's now put up by the government? that a member of this House is to have his freedom of speech denied because he runs the risk of being pilloried simply because he asks for leave to table a document and that leave is granted by a minister and no objection is taken by any honourable member and no objection is taken by the chair because they are the basic facts in this matter. A member asked for leave to table the statutory declaration. The minister examined the document and gave that leave. No one, no member, neither the acting speaker or anyone else, took any objection whatsoever 
any objection whatsoever to the uh, tabling of the statutory declaration. And now it is said, on the basis of that, not on his allegations, not on the member's allegations, but on the basis of him tabling a statutory declaration, that he is to be hauled before the Privileges Committee, convicted as a result of a kangaroo court of the worst order, breaching natural justice at every opportunity, and then to be, in effect, censured by this House. Now, we believe the Honourable Member for Farrer and myself and the Honourable Member for Morton, for Hume, the Honourable Member for Hume and the Honourable Member for uh, Morton and myself, and I'm sure the Honourable Member for Flinders would associate himself with these remarks, but he's unfortunately not here. We believe that this was a travesty of justice from beginning to end, and it would be a considerable denial of the rights of free speech of members of this House guaranteed under the Bill of Rights of 1689 if a member now were to be punished in this way that's proposed simply for exercising his rights of freedom of speech in this House. That is what the government is doing, and it should be ashamed of it, and the House should indicate its appalling re its a rejection of this motion with, uh, in no uncertain terms. The Honourable term. Member's time has expired. The Honourable Member for Canning. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I seek uh, leave to table two documents on behalf of the Committee of Privileges. Is leave granted? The two documents are the, uh, the minutes of proceedings granted. and the transcript uh, of evidence, is leave as granted. agreed to by the committee. Leave is granted. Thank you. I present a copy of the proof transcript of evidence taken during the inquiry, which the committee has authorised for publication, and a copy of the minutes of the committee's meetings on 30th November 1989. <laughs> Mr Speaker, as chairman of the Committee of Privileges, it would not be appropriate for me to argue the merits of the matter now before the House. Nevertheless, it may help the House if I recount to it the substance of the committee's report. In the report I presented on 30th November, the committee notes that the allegation contained in the speech by the honourable member for Bruce during grievance debate on 23 November amounted to a serious imputation against and personal reflection on the honourable member for Hotham, but that the circumstance of the speech created difficulties for the chair in the application of the rules of the House. The committee noted that there is often an inclination on the parts of members to bypass the correct forms of the House in the make, making of charges and allegations. The committee believed that it had not been charged with the responsibility of making a determination of the substance or otherwise of the statements in the statutory declaration which contained the allegation against the honourable member for Hotham. It noted that in the ultimate it did not have the capacity to conduct an authoritative investigation into the allegation itself. The committee reported to the House its conclusions that a, whilst acting on the basis of information presented to him, the honourable member for Bruce, if of the view that the allegation should have been brought before the House, should also have been alert to the requirement that such a matter ought to be put forward by means of a substantive motion, open to, to debate and which would admit a distinct vote of the House. B, as a matter of urgency, the attention of all members should be drawn to the requirements of the standing orders and practices of the House which govern the matters of reflections on and charges against members. And C, the great privilege of freedom of speech carries with it a heavy obligation that it be exercised with great care and responsibility, and that the misuse of this privilege in making charges against other persons, whether members or not, could be held by the House to be not only an abuse but a contempt. The committee found that having regard to the experience of the honourable member for Bruce, he had offended against the rules of the House. Accordingly, the committee recommended that the honourable member should, at the first parliamentary opportunity, be required to apologise to the House for the serious breach. It recommended that the House require him to withdraw the allegation. The committee's report was accompanied by two dissenting reports. Those who have read the report and the dissenting reports will recognise that there was a measure of disagreement on the committee. I do not wish to go into the detail of the committee's operations now, but I would say that this case illustrates how difficult it can be for members of the House to make judgments about their fellow members. I wish to also emphasise the point made by the committee about the great
privilege of freedom of speech. This privilege carries with it a very heavy responsibility. As members, we must be careful in our use of this privilege and in our use of the forms of the House. Freedom of speech is essential to the Parliament and I do not think any member would deny this. Nevertheless, the community is entitled to expect a very high degree of responsibility and care in the raising of serious matters, whether about members or other people. I do not wish to argue the merits of the present matter, but have sought only to recount the substance of the main report for the information of members. The Honourable Member for White Bay. Mr Speaker. It will not have escaped the attention of the House that my name is listed among those who supported the majority report to the Parliament. For that reason alone, I think it appropriate that I say something. But I move beyond that to express my disenchantment that the presentation by the Honourable Member for Menzies might well be described as that sort of presentation that would be given by a learned man of the law on behalf of a client at considerable costs, not necessarily to secure him justice, but to ensure that he escaped it. Now, what are the simple facts of the matter? And I'm conscious that my friend, the Honourable Member for Bruce, is virtually at arm's length, just beyond it, which might be a happy circumstance. <laughs> that he knows, as we know, over seven parliaments, we get to know each other. That he came into this House with the firm intention of, to use the vernacular, tipping a bucket on the Honourable Member for Hotham. Does any member in this House, including the Honourable Member for Bruce, suggest for one moment that that was not the case? It goes without saying. He came to tip a bucket on the Honourable Member for Hotham notwithstanding that Standing Order 76 clearly says all imputations of improper motives and all personal reflections on members shall be considered highly disorderly. So he wittingly, knowingly, deliberately came in the House to defy that Standing Order, which is a cardinal Standing Order, should be firmly imprinted in the minds of every member coming into this House. If there is need to raise a matter which impugns, directly or indirectly, another member, there are forms of the House by which it might be done. But the Honourable Member for Bruce on this occasion decided that he would treat the forms of the House, dare I say it, with contempt. His particular mission was of greater importance than the forms of this House. So he embarked on an exercise which was characterised by a duplicity. The committee in its report to the House pointed out that it was difficult for the presiding officer to deal with the emerging contempt or defiance of standing orders because the Honourable Member Bruce, with almost an admirable cunning, knew the way to get around that particular problem was to use the statutory declaration which damned another member on this house, but with a delightful degree of anonymity. No names, no pack drill. But in the final seconds of his address, he said, with a retrospectivity, with which his house is no stranger, that the public figure referred to was the honourable member for Hotham. Now, that was just as damning and just as telling as if he had started his delivery with the, the very statement that he was about to pour a bucket on the Honourable Member for Hotham. <laughs> so there can be no mistake about the intent and the effect. Now it has been put by the Honourable Member for Menzies that so there were a number of technical points, legal points, which should subvert, should Order. subvert the determination of the committee. For example, that the Speaker did not retire and give thought, and I, as acting speaker, had to do that very thing. And I did retire and give thought to whether it had been a breach of privilege, because it was a rather delicate and sensitive thing which was not of a proportion to reg be regaled by that description, a breach of privilege. My colleague in the rear seat was involved in that. 
But I, I came to the conclusion that the House was best served by consulting its dignity. And I think that was the best course of action. But on the other end of the spectrum, there could be a breach which instantly be recognised by all in the House and the Chair and the Speaker as a breach of privilege or containing the elements, the characteristics of a breach of privilege and did not have occasion to retire. His approval, endorsement of a referral to the Privileges Committee would be instant and automatic. And I suggest in this case that is what was done. There was no particular problem in having it referred to the committee. The allegation is made that the committee did not deal with the breach of privilege alleged. It did. There was a, a complaint that we did not say in our report that there was no breach of privilege. For heaven's sake, that was implicit, implicit in the report. We're a privileges committee. We'd addressed it. We did not report to the House there'd been a breach of privilege, but we had dealt with another abuse of the forms of the House, which is clearly saying, implying, if you like. Perhaps in hindsight we should have been more specific, but it was implying that whilst there was not a breach of privilege, there was a misuse of the forms of the House. How nonsensical for the committee to go away and study this in very tight terms and simply come back and say there's no breach of privilege by inference and it was contained in the Honourable Member for Menzies remarks. If we'd come back here and said there was no breach of privilege, that would tacitly endorse every subsequent abuse of the same nature. But the committee, if you like, assumed the responsibility to point out to the House that this is a course of action that could not be tolerated by the House and not, should not be supported by any member, and therefore behoved us to address ourselves again to the standing orders to ensure that there is no abuse on another member of this House other than by the forms provided for it. And that, of course, is not necessarily seen in the first instance as an abuse, but an imputation or a reflection. And in the ultimate, there may be substance, but that's for the House to determine by way of vote whether or not the motion carried substance. There were a number of suggestions in the minority reports that the committee had been derelict. Yes, the committee had been derelict. I'm at the end of my seventh parliament, my final parliament, and I go back to whence I came. And I've tried to be an upright parliamentarian, to concern myself with the truth. And just as I told a reporter who descended on me, after the report had been furnished to the Parliament, and he said, why, Mr Miller, did you align yourself with the government position? That offended me. Not in a personal way, but the very suggestion offended me. And I said to him, in the Privileges Committee, there should be no alignment with anything other than the facts and the truth. And that's the only alignment I would accept. And it grieves me to have to say to this House that for the first time in a privileges committee, I was far from convinced that there was not a political motivation or a misplaced loyalty within that committee to bring around a divided conclusion on that committee. The House would be well served. My friend, the Honourable Member for Bruce, will be well served to acknowledge that he had misused the forms of the House, not breached privilege, misused the forms of the House, and to dignify this place that he should withdraw and apologise for his breach. The Honourable Member for McEwen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman on the speech he just made. In fact, it's very difficult to follow, because he has said much that we would all agree within this House, irrespective of what side we sit on, but which, because of partisan politics, is often not said. And there was indeed a fair degree of partisan politics entered into the Committee's deliberations and findings, and allegations are being made uh, by some members of that committee. And in fact, it was a stacked committee that, in fact, natural justice was denied, and that the Honourable Gentleman did not get a fair hearing. 
Now, I find that rather strange when a Queen's Council of the Victorian Bar, the member for Menzies, sat on that committee. I find it strange that he would say natural justice was denied when he has, in his capacity as a Queen's Council and a member of this House, just given a professional defence of the honourable gentleman. I find it strange that you would say natural justice was denied when the member for Flinders, a solicitor from Victoria, also sat on that committee and in his dissenting report has given a spirited defence of the honourable gentleman. I find it even stranger that one would say that natural justice was denied when the member for Sturt, the Honourable Ian Wilson, who was a lawyer, was given permission and did appear before the committee to advise the member for Bruce on how he should respond to questions, one would assume, but he was there as an advisor. And yet we're told today by the member for Menzies, the member for Bruce was denied natural justice. Now, there are three competent, qualified lawyers, I would assume, who have been in a position to put a defence to assist the honourable member, and yet we're told in this House he was denied natural justice. Frankly, that must only be partisan politics speaking. It cannot be any common sense approach to this difficult question. And the reality is, of course, Mr Speaker, that in the evidence that was given to the committee, the member for Bruce said in his opening statement, on oath, and I quote, I am somewhat at a loss to understand how Mr Holding came to believe that I raised allegations that the honourable member for Hotham was an agent of a foreign power and a traitor. I made no such allegations. Mr Holding's representation to what I said during the grievance debate of 23rd of November 1989 is a total misrepresentation of what I in fact said and that is sworn evidence given to the committee by the honourable gentleman. And yet when I took the opportunity as a member of that committee to ask this following question, perhaps I could ask a question despite that answer Mr Chairman. In your statement, Mr Aldred, you have just said that you are at a loss to understand how it can be said that you made any allegations that the Honourable Member for Hotham, Lewis Kent, was in the service of a foreign power. I draw your attention to the newspaper reports in the Sydney Morning Herald of the 24th November 1989, the Canberra Times, 24th November 1989, The Age, 24th November 1989, the Sydney Daily Telegraph, 24th November 1989. The Australian, 24th November 1989. All of those newspaper reports, all of those articles, say that you alleged in the House of Representatives those facts. And you have not sought a personal explanation in this House to deny that those newspaper reports are incorrect. Why have you not denied in the House that those reports alleging that you made those allegations untrue. Mr Aldred replied, on oath, Mr Chairman, I have made my position perfectly clear. Now, what can one draw from that conclusion? What can one draw from that conclusion? Every newspaper reporter who sat in the gallery, by invitation, quite right, by invitation by the honourable gentleman, Every one of those reported that the member made those allegations. Every one of them in the newspapers. Now we know the forms of this House are such that if a report is given which is incorrect, you make at the most available moment a personal explanation to this House and you deny those reports. To this day, at this moment, the member for Bruce has not stood in this House and denied that those newspaper reports were inaccurate and did not reflect what he said in this House. Now, if any member of this House has been condemned by his own actions or lack of them, it is the member for Bruce. Totally condemned. And if you look at his evidence, and every member should read the transcript, 
It cannot be said that the gentleman comes into this debate with clean hands. Now, it has been said that he didn't get fair hearing. There was a, a court of there to put him into this position. And yet the member, his history, is consistent with this approach. And it is appropriate that I, as a member, and as a member of that committee, put to this House what that evidence is. Because it is relevant to his actions before the committee, the evidence he gave to the committee, and his actions up to this date. Now, back in March 1980, the member, together with the Victorian member of the Victorian Parliament, Don Saltmarsh, produced what was called a confidential report. It named people involved in drug trafficking, racketeering, gambling, prostitution, and other activities, and he named industry leaders, trade union officials, politicians, never a Liberal politician, mind you, but Labor Party politicians, and police. Now, the reports were made available to the Victorian Police and the Australian Federal Police Force, and their finding? Rumour mongering. Totally unsubstantiated. Rumour mongering. We go to November 1983, and under parliamentary privilege, he asked the Prime Minister why the Prime Minister was involved in organised crime with casinos. No proof, no evidence, but under privilege, the Cowards Act. November 1983, again, along a similar vein, he alleged that the Prime Minister, when ACTU President, and Mr David Coombe held a secret meeting in New York with a Mafia boss. The so-called boss of Mr Sam Amarina, the proprietor of a coffee shop in the city, was approached by the Australian media and he was reported as saying, a couple of guys walked in and had coffee. I didn't know them. Whoever those guys were, they sure didn't look like no Prime Minister. But that's the basis of the allegation he's prepared to put to this House. That's the basis of it. In October 1983, right, he claimed he had ironclad evidence. Let's hear that, ironclad evidence of a pending backbench result of a vote among the government that would result in the overthrow of the Prime Minister. He said he had leaked documents. Never produced, never saw the light of day, never substantiated. Again said in this place, Coward's Castle. In 1986, early 1986, he claimed to have evidence that Soviet spies were operating in southern Sweden and were active in gathering information on the Swedish the submarine for New England on a point of order. But 1986 has nothing to do with the Committee of Privileges report. I'd suggest this is a very serious matter, not one that should be now denigrated by a personal attack on the Honourable Member for Pearce. Well, I think, I think the, the, the member for McEwen is giving examples of the behaviour of the member for Bruce. And, and as such, he is, I, would, I assume, is giving reasons that drew him to his conclusions on the committee, and I find him in order. Mr Speaker. And he claimed that the Soviet spies were acting in gathering information on the Swedish submarine builder Cockham's. He used this, again, undocumented, unsubstantiated rumour, if it isn't rumour, because he probably made it up himself, for a call for the reopening of Defence Department tenders for the then proposed to build submarines for the Royal Australian Navy. He further claimed Cockham's were mounting a disinformation program and a campaign with the aim of discrediting anyone raising those criticisms against their dockyard. Can you imagine a major international company not exercising in some kind of public relations exercise when his claims would cost them billions of dollars? Never substantiated, treated by this parliament as a joke, but did not prevent the member, does not prevent him from making such outrageous, unproved and unsubstantiated claims. In June 86, again underprivileged, the Honourable Gentleman made allegations that the late Mr Justice Lionel Murphy had a secret meeting for unknown and unstated reasons with crime czar Abe Saffron. Murphy denied the allegation, as did Saffron. We never saw any evidence, any substantiation, nothing that would prove that allegation, and yet it did not prevent this gentleman from standing in this House under privilege from making that claim. In May 1986, in a triumph of distortion and misinformation, 
The gentleman alleged that a commander of the Australian Federal Police had issued an instruction to staff not to pursue investigations into illegal migrants. Apparently, in the view of the honourable gentleman, this issue became translated into the claim that the government was leaving the way open for Australians to become a haven for Chinese triad groups. In fact, the honourable gentleman had misread or misinterpreted a directive which had been issued and which said, and I quote, drug trafficking and organised crime were to be the Australian Federal Police Force's major priorities. He wasn't far out. You're quite right. The, the Honourable Member for McEwen might um, quickly get to the point. Uh, that the made. point is, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm the Speaker, that this gentleman, the Honourable Member for Bruce, Mr Speaker, I'm sorry, does not come into this House and cannot give evidence to a parliamentary committee claiming that he does not know what he is doing. He cannot in any honesty or with any integrity at all claim that he either has a distorted view of the world, a conspiracy theory that everyone is out to get everyone else, or he just frankly does not understand the expression relevance. Anyone who has a history, and I haven't finished his history, such as the member for Bruce as a member of this House has, who is believed by anyone, you'd really have to question anyone's integrity who believed anything he said. And to now, on this occasion, to give sworn evidence before a privileges committee that he did not make those claims against the member concerned on that history, how can this House believe the gentleman? How can this House? And if there is going to be any integrity at all. And if this House will ever get to the stage where people stop tipping buckets on each other, then the House has to make some stand itself. Because it is not difficult to tip buckets. It is not difficult at all. It would not be difficult for me to make allegations against the member for Flinders involved in a cherry picking scheme. Order. It would not the, be difficult for me the to make similar McEwen. allegations. In well, the I go spirit no further of this debate, that. the Honourable Member for McEwen might just withdraw that. I, well, I have made no allegations other than mention a name, but if it's offensive, I withdraw, Mr Speaker. But I make the point, it is not difficult for anyone, for anyone, to make allegations against other members and drop buckets. And I don't. And I won't. I have files on people from information which gets given to me, which I could stand up and drop buckets, but I won't. And I find it offensive, as a member of this House, that it is so easy for some other members to use the privilege they have of free speech to do it. Because, as the Leader of the House says, that privilege did not come easily to the Parliament. It was fought for in the Bill of Rights in the 1600s. It should not be abused, because if the House abuses that right of free speech, then ultimately this parliament diminishes in importance and in value. And I would support strongly the motion and I would urge the member to comply with the forms of the House and withdraw the allegation. And I'd respect him if he did so. The Honourable Member for Morton. Thank you very much, um, Mr Speaker. The committee's report uh, in part C refers to, and I quote from it, the great privilege of freedom of speech carries with it a heavy obligation that it be exercised with great care and responsibility and that the misuse of this privilege in making charges against other persons, whether members or not, could be held by the House to be not only an abuse but a contempt. It is proper to refer to the fact that the Privileges Committee did not find that there had been a contempt. I re refer particularly to the fact that that paragraph alludes to the realities that a reflection on members of this place and people outside this place can command the same 
gravity of seriousness if improperly used. The member for Wide Bay, in his comments before, asserted that the member for Bruce had come into this place for the purpose of tipping a bucket on the member for Hotham. Indeed, in the cross-examination of the member for Bruce, I did make an observation by way of a question that uh, I didn't believe that the member for Bruce had actually come into this place on that day to enhance the reputation of the member for Hotham. I made that comment. I, I recall it well. I have known the member for Hotham since he entered this place in, I think, about 1980, and I've known the member for Bruce since he entered this place in the 1970s. And to be placed in a position of making judgment on the contents of either direct or indirect allegations is always difficult. And there's always that danger of, of one allowing personal associations to cloud judgment. In this instance, I am not without respect for the member for Bruce and I am not without respect for the member for Hotham. The vast majority of Australians have little understanding of the power that they place in our hands when they elect representatives to this place. We have the power to make or break people in terms of what we say in this place. We can build a reputation and we can destroy a reputation. And it behoves each and every one of us to never forget that we possess a power which belongs to the rest of the community only for a passing moment should they be in a court situation and be in a situation whereby they can say what they feel or like. And then the court judges the veracity of the truth. But we have that power all the time. And therefore, we have that obligation to never improperly use it. I, Mr Speaker, have been here for a period in excess of 20 years, and it is a rare occasion that I have used the mechanism that indeed was used by the member for Bruce in that statutory declaration that he read into this place. In about May 1978, I named a member at the end of a speech. The last two words that I uttered were that person's name because that was a mechanism that I could use to say what I felt and I'm absolutely positive that if I'd used the mechanism of a substantive motion, that the government of the day would have clouted me and gagged me. And these mechanisms exist to allow people to come in this place and as long as they honestly hold a view, as long as they believe in what they're saying, as long as they've discharged the responsibility of doing as much checking on the facts as they possibly can, I see nothing wrong with a person, if they genuinely and honestly believe something, in using the privilege that the people of our electorates and the people of this nation have given us. Now, I do not seek to make a judgment on the allegations which were contained in that statutory declaration. I have a view, perhaps, but I am in no position, nor was the Privileges Committee in a position to judge the truth of it all. We walked away from that quite happily and judged ourselves as not having the competence, the competence to make judgments. 
And not having made that judgment, Mr. Speaker, we have now put ourselves in a position that not only do we find findings which are against the member for Bruce, and I remind this House or inform this House that in many ways I was happy to go along with reminding this parliament and members of their obligations in terms of the use of the procedures of this place. But when we reach a stage where we demand of the member for Bruce, we demand of the member for Bruce that he apologise to the House for his serious breach and that and we recommend that the House requires him to withdraw the allegation. And then we are looking today at saying to him that if he doesn't fulfil the requirements, that we will move that he be suspended for the service of the House for two sitting days, including today. I just wonder whether or not we've gone truly overboard. I have been in this place and seen members of the previous government side, and I'm not saying it is misuse of any procedure belongs to any side of the House, but I have seen reputations sullied, the people from the outside world sullied time and time again, particularly in relation to taxation matters, and people get away with it and the people outside squirming and calling for an opportunity to clear their name. And yet this parliament did not see a reason for references to the Privileges Committee or reason to make judgments on member, one in particular, who in those days sat on this side of the House. Suddenly there is great indignation. Suddenly it's terrible and suddenly the member for Bruce has to be brought to account for his actions. We in the committee could not find that a breach of privilege actually existed. And yet we are here today making recommendations or the, the government with its motion is making a recommendation that the member for Bruce be subjected to banishment from this place for two days unless he says sorry. Well, Mr Speaker, I have the view that if the member for Bruce is one who misuses, abuses or carelessly uses the forms of this House, his jury lies back in his electorate. There's a second unofficial jury and they are, they constitute the members of his party, of the Liberal Party, who subject him to his pre-selection. Now, if the member for Bruce genuinely and honestly believes that there is a matter to be, to be pursued in this place in the name of the nation's security or in the name of the security of an ethnic group in this country, as long as he has fulfilled the obligations of properly researching and not carelessly researching, that only the test of time will give us the answer. The member for Hotham is unlike the victims of so many people whose reputation or people from outside whose reputations have been sullied by attacks in this place. Because the member for Hotham sits here with the same privileges that I have that the member for Hotham that every other individual in this place possesses, and that is the right to stand up and to defend. That is something that we are very privileged to possess, and something which, as I've already said, is something which does not belong to the vast majority of the people. We listened to the member for McEwen before, and he couldn't help himself. One of the jury, but he couldn't help himself digging the knife in a couple of times along the road during his speech when he uttered the words, when he referred to a rumour and said 
or, or some other matter that the member for Bruce had raised in previous years, referred to it at rumour and then said that the member for Bruce, quote, had probably made it up. And then made some aspersion about some cherry picking and the member for Flinders that I've never heard of. See, that's the nature of this place. That's the nature of this place. And what we are about to do, or what we are being asked to do, is to condemn a member of this place for using a mechanism for uttering a form of words that have now been judged as an imputation without those imputations having been subjected to analysis by us who are making the recommendations in the, the original report. Here we are setting ourselves up while some of us who are on the jury can't even resist repeating in part what we are about or this House will probably, by virtue of political numbers, condemn on Christmas Eve the member for Bruce for having done. And I just say those words and the member from Western Australia there may sit and laugh, but the reality is that what we are doing today is saying tut tut, naughty naughty, evil evil for some, for, uh, to a member who has done something that is simply being judged as being more serious by virtue of the implications for the member for Hotham than what other people have done on so many previous occasions. All I ask for, Mr Speaker, is absolute consistency, utter consistency. The Speaker of the day or the acting Speaker of the day should have, and there's no excusing this, by a form of words which refers to the acting speaker having found himself or herself in a situation of difficulty. Because the rules of this House, if they are such that what the member for Bruce had done should have been expunged or been withdrawn, the speaker that I should have cut in, whether it be then or later, and said, hey, you must withdraw that, or I call on the member for Bruce to withdraw those those words or, or that document that's been tabled should never have been tabled. We cannot excuse, and I don't say this disrespectfully for one moment, we cannot excuse an oversight on the part of the chair by saying that it was made difficult by the member for Bruce. Because I think this is germane to it. The chair, whether it had been then or later, should have stood up in this place and said, this is judged as contravention of standing order, I think it is 76, okay, 76, and therefore I require of you to withdraw it. So if mistakes were made on the day, they do not belong solely to the member for Bruce. There is a shared responsibility, and I conclude on the remarks, that saying that people like the late Kevin Hooper, the Labor man from Queensland, years ago stood in that Queensland parliament making allegations that there was corruption in, in, in certain elements in Queensland. And he wasn't wrong. OK, and I tell you what, if the Kevin Hoopers in this world had been silenced from the start, a lot of things which eventually did come out would never have come out. And, Mr Speaker, I treat the privilege that is given to me as an utter privilege, and I just hope that we don't go recklessly and ab with a gay abandon into sentencing a man and punishing him for doing something that so many of others have done in the past. The Honourable Member for Hughes. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, many things have been said in the course of this debate, uh, which I don't intend to go over again. But I would like to raise a number of matters that I think are important uh, for each and every individual member of this House to consider. And I put it in those terms because it seems to me that this is a debate uh, very much uh, about the role of the parliament and each and every one of us as parliamentarians has got to decide what stand we're going to take on this issue. I must say it was a matter of uh, some concern that the member for Menzies rose in his place at the commencement of this debate and said that the opposition opposes this motion. Well, Mr Speaker, I can't believe that this is a matter that has been caucused on by the opposition uh, at this date. Uh, and uh, I can't believe that the parliamentarians on the opposition benches, 
of whom there are a considerable number and whom the member for Wide Bay uh, stands as preeminent, I cannot believe that parliamentarians will in some mindless way uh, raise their hands in support of the, uh, the views that have been put by the member for Menzies because they are neither, because they are neither uh, true, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, nor, they, nor do they, I believe, uh, have any moral foundation. The report that's been brought down by the Privileges Committee uh, is only two pages. Uh, it is not a weighty document. It is not a report that seeks to vilify uh, the, uh, the member who was the subject uh, of the allegation. Uh, it is not a report that seeks to impose some uh, draconian penalty on the honourable member. It is a report which is moderate, which is balanced, but which seeks to uphold the preeminent position of the parliament and the standing orders and practices of the parliament. And I'll just briefly remind uh, members uh, of the three elements of that, re that report. Uh, the first one, of course, was that the member for Bruce ought to have been alert to the requirement that such a matter ought to be put forward by means of a substantive motion open to debate and which would admit a distinct vote of the House. Now, the member has been a member of the House of Representatives for approximately 10 years. He's not a new member, he's not an experienced member, and uh, as we've heard uh, from some of the remarks that have been made in the course of this debate, uh, he is well versed uh, in parliamentary techniques. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is a long-standing practice of this House, based on the practices of the House of Commons, based on long parliamentary traditions, that that standing order be observed. Mr Deputy Speaker, furthermore, Standing Order 76 of the House of Representatives is crystal clear. It is probably the most quoted standing order in the Parliament, and that is that all imputations of improper motives and all personal reflections on members shall be considered highly disorderly. Now, the member for Wide Bay uh, has uh, told uh, far better than I am able to do so the, the uh, sequence of events that led to uh, the member raising these matters in the House and the fact that the naming of the member occurred in almost the last sentence of his speech. Now, I believe that it is open on any reasonable interpretation of what occurred uh, to uh, view the method of delivering that speech as a calculated uh, attempt to uh, effectively ambush whoever might be in the chair at that particular time. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is also a matter of fact, of which this House is entitled to take notice, that within 15 minutes uh, of the member making his contributions in the House of Representatives, attacking the member for Hotham, substantially the same matters, within 15 minutes, were raised in the Senate. Now, that may, of course, just be uh, purely a matter of coincidence. It happened to have been raised by a senator of the same political party from the same state. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, the second matter that the uh, majority committee uh, looked to uh, was the uh, view that members ought to have their attention drawn to the standing order to orders and practices of the House which govern uh, matters of reflection and charges against members. So, in other words, the view of the committee sought to raise the tenor of debate and recognise the importance of proper debate within this parliamentary chamber. And the third thing that was in that majority report, of which uh, I was a party, was that the great privilege of freedom of speech carries with it heavy obligations that should be exercised with great care and responsibility and uh, went on to say uh, that the member, having regard to his experience, had offended against the rules of the House. And accordingly, the committee recommends that the member should, at the first parliamentary opportunity, be required to apologise to the House for the serious breach and recommends that the House requires him to withdraw that allegation. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, as you can see, that is a moderate, a balanced report, one which seeks to do justice in this case. Uh, and uh, one which I believe the House ought to adopt. Now, by way of comparison, there are two minority reports. Two minority reports 
uh, which in their totality are of nine pages in length as compared with the balanced majority report of only two pages. You can search and read and reread those dissenting reports by the member for Flinders and the member for Menzies. You will not find one single word, one single word that in any way is even the, in, to any degree the most uh, mildly critical of the actions of the member for Bruce. Not one single word. Those minority reports are all about uh, a political attack, I believe, on the majority of members of that committee who included the member for Wide Bay. I do not believe that any parliamentarian on any rational reading of that report, both majority and minority, uh, could uh, support the minority view. Now, Mr uh, Deputy, Mr Speaker, uh, I, uh, in the, together with many other members, in the course of the, uh, elevated again, in the course of the uh, a, uh, questions asked of Mr Aldred, uh, focused on the question of whether or not there had been imputations of improper motives or personal reflections. And Mr Aldred said uh, that he did not believe that the standing orders had been breached. Well, I uh, just uh, again uh, refer to matters referred to by the member for McEwen. Just about every major newspaper in this country uh, took the view that the import of uh, the member for Bruce's uh, speech was to accuse the member for Hotham of spy links, uh, to uh, accuse uh, uh, again, uh, links with spies, links with Yugoslav secret police, and so it goes on. Now, I ask every member of this House to put themselves in the position of the member for Hotham. And I have a view that most people who come into this chamber, in fact, almost all, uh, come here basically as fairly committed people, people basically of integrity. And all of us make mistakes from time to time. When we go overboard, we make errors of judgment. But I ask every member to put themselves in the position of the member for Hotham. Can you imagine to pick up the morning papers and find what has, uh, by any, uh, any interpretation, been an attempt to blacken your name, to besmirch your name, to tear down your reputation? Can you imagine the consequences of that for you? in your electorate, with your family, with your friends? Can you imagine what happens to a person who's been subject to that abuse? Well, the member for Reid can, and the member for Reid, in a very dispassionate and reasoned contribution in this House, reminded us of the hurt that such unsubstantiated and damaging allegations can make to a person. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I, I repeat uh, that I do believe that the, the uh, majority report is quite balanced, and for that reason I urge the House to support it. I would, however, alert the House to two precedents where the attention of the House has been drawn to breaches of the standing orders subsequent to uh, the occurrence of that breach. And, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, we on this side of the chamber are not immune uh, from having uh, people tipped buckets, and of course, uh, uh, Bert James and Eddie Ward were preeminent uh, in uh, that role and developed to an art form. But what happened, of course, on uh, two occasions uh, when uh, the then Speaker was alerted to the fact that there had been a breach of the standing orders, even though that had occurred on a prior occasion, the Speaker, quite uh, properly in the Parliament and the House, intervened to insist that there was a withdrawal of those matters. And in this case, uh, the House is taking that initiative. It is an initiative based on precedent. It is one based on morality and in the traditions of this parliament. And I would hope that all parliamentarians on the opposition benches would vote according to their consci consciences and not according to the party dictates. Thank the House. The Honourable Member for Bruce. For Bruce. Mr Speaker, in this chamber on the 23rd of November last at 12.30, uh, I spoke in the grievance debate. On the same day, the Minister for the Arts, some two and a half hours later, raised a matter of privilege concerning my speech uh, in the grievance debate. 
As a result of the matter of privilege uh, raised, the House resolved to refer the matter to the Committee of Privileges. In the very late hours of uh, the 27th of November, I received a letter dated that day from the Chairman of the Committee of Privileges, the member for Canning. The letter said, and I quote, the committee has agreed to the following resolution with regard to the reference. One, that the allegation referred to it comprised the address made to the House by the member for Bruce on the 23rd of November 1989, recorded at Hansard page 2804 to 2806. Two, that the allegation by the Honourable Member for Bruce concerns the character and conduct of the Honourable Member for Hotham in his capacity as a member of the House. Three, that Mr Alder would be invited to address the committee at the earliest opportunity. And that's the end of the quote from the letter. Mr Speaker, four o'clock on the 28th of November, the following day, and less than 24 hours after receiving the letter, was suggested as the time for me to first appear before the Committee of Privileges. With regard to the resolution spelt out in the Chairman's letter, it is important for me uh, at the outset, uh, Mr Speaker, to draw to the attention of the House the gross misrepresentations made by the Minister for the Arts when he raised the matter of privilege. I should add that I also brought this very same matter to the attention of the Committee of Privileges during my first appearance before them. At uh, Hansard page 2837 of the 23rd of November, the Minister for the Arts says, and I quote, it has been suggested by innuendo and by direct statement that the Honourable Member for Hotham is virtually an agent of a foreign power. That is the allegation. It is simple and direct as that." Uh, end of quote. At Hansard on the same page, the Minister for the Arts says, and I quote, "'What more prima facie case can one have than someone saying that a member of this parliament is a traitor not merely to this institution but also to his country?' That is the allegation." End of the further quote from the Minister. Mr Speaker, as I told the uh, committee during my first appearance, I am at a loss to understand how the Minister of the Arts came to believe that I raised allegations that the member for Hotham was an agent of a foreign power and a traitor. I made no such allegations. The Minister for the Arts' uh, representation of what I said during the grievance debate on the 23rd of November last is a total and gross misrepresentation of what I in fact said. In concluding my remarks, uh, Mr Speaker, to the Committee of Privileges during my appearance before them on the 28th of November last, I also asked the Committee whether the Minister for the Arts should disqualify himself from the Committee for the purposes of the inquiry, in view of the fact that it was he who raised the matter of privilege and because of the manner in which he had raised it. The question of whether the Minister for the Arts was an appropriate person to serve on the Committee and whether, in fact, his presence on the Committee was properly constitutional given that he was appointed by the Leader of the House after the inquiry had already started, is addressed in some detail by the member for Flinders in his dissenting report of the 30th of November. Mr Speaker, the 23rd of November I received a further letter from the Chairman of the Committee of Privileges. I noted from the letter that the Committee had the day before passed a resolution in the following terms, and I quote, that Mr Alder would be invited to appear before the Committee at 8.30am tomorrow to make uh, any further statement and to answer any questions in respect of his use of the procedures uh, this House during the grievance debate on the 23rd of November. End of the quote from the letter. Um, Mr, uh, Mr Speaker, it was the substance of the matters dealt with uh, by me in my address of the 23rd of November which were referred to the Committee of Privileges for consideration and not the procedures of the House during the address referred to. As I said to the committee during my second appearance on the 30th of November, it is my submission that my use of the procedures of the House is a matter for the Speaker and not one which was referred to the Committee of Privileges by the House when it resolved, and I quote, that the allegation against the Honourable Member for Hotham be referred to the Committee of Privileges, end of quote. Furthermore, uh, Mr Speaker, during my second appearance, I also brought to the attention of the committee the findings of the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Privilege, that is, the final report of October 1984 as contained in Recommendation 21. As I said to the committee at the time, though this recommendation has not yet been adopted by the House, it, or the version adopted by the Senate, should in practice be followed by the House of Representatives Committee of Privileges. In particular, I draw the notice of the committee uh, recommendations uh, 21C, D, F, G and I. Recommendation 21C says, and I quote, issues before the committee should be adequately defined so that a person or organisation against whom a complaint has been made is reasonably apprised of the nature of the complaint he has to meet." End of quote. 
At no stage, Mr Speaker, did the committee precisely define the matters it proposed to deliberate on, thus denying me the basic right to be informed of the committee's concerns. Recommendation 21D says, and I quote, a person or organisation against whom a complaint is made should have a reasonable time for the preparation of an answer to that complaint, end of quote. This recommendation raised two points. Firstly, as per recommendation 21C, the complaint was never precisely defined. And secondly, I was certainly not given a reasonable time to answer anything. Recommendation 21F and G say, uh, respectively, and I quote, a person or organisation against whom a complaint is made should have the right to adduce evidence relevant to the issues, end of quote, and, I quote further, a person or organisation against whom a complaint is made should have the right to cross-examine witnesses subject to a discretion of the committee to exclude cross-examination on matters it thinks ought fairly to be excluded, such as matters of a scandalous, improper, peripheral or prejudicial nature, end of quote. Mr Speaker, it is suffice to say that the committee denied me both these rights. Finally, uh, recommendation 21I says, and I quote, a person or organisation against whom a complaint has been made shall be entitled to full legal representation and to examine or to cross-examine witnesses through such representation and to present submissions to the committee through such representation, end of quote. Mr Speaker, this right was also denied me despite my asking the committee on two separate occasions for time to retain and brief counsel on a full professional basis. Mr Speaker, one utterance made by the Minister for the Arts on the 23rd of November least was, uh, was at least correct. He said, and I quote, there is much learning on the whole question of privileges. Most of it uh, is to be found not in this house, but in the House of Commons, and I, uh, end of quote. And on this rare occasion, uh, Mr Speaker, I find myself in agreement uh, with the Minister. However, despite this House lacking any detailed learning on the matter of privilege, it will be apparent to you and any others who have read the uh, committee's uh, report that I did not commit a breach of privilege. Mr Speaker, there are a number of serious matters emanating from the report of the Committee of Privileges that the House needs to address. Given that you are the protector of the rights of members, uh, Mr Speaker, I ask for your advice on the following matters. However, before I do, I'd ask all honourable members to also carefully consider the matters I'm about to raise as they are indeed uh, very serious. Firstly, was the motion of reference valid or invalid? Secondly, was the committee properly constituted? Thirdly, the member for Menzies at paragraph 11 in his dissenting report says into Alia, and I quote, the majority report reaches no conclusions on whether a breach of privilege has been committed. As such, it has failed to discharge its responsibility to the House. This point is one that all members need to personally address. It is my contention that on reading the majority report uh, that no breach of privilege was found uh, to have occurred and therefore the committee has in fact to fail to discharge its responsibility to the House. Fourthly, the uh, member for Menzies at paragraph 12 in his dissenting report also raised the matter of whether the Committee of Privileges has any jurisdiction to deal with a breach of the rules of the House, as they have done in their report. I therefore ask, Mr Speaker, does the Committee of Privileges have the authority to deal with an alleged breach of the rules of the House or anything else other than the actual matter referred to it by the House? Fifthly, did the Committee of Privileges precisely define the matters which it proposed to deliberate on? And if so, do you consider that I was informed on those matters? Six. Is it the usual practice of the committee to obtain uh, uh, legal advice from the clerk of the House? I'd ask you to particularly address that question, Mr Speaker. Seventhly, given that committee members intimately left the room whilst I was giving evidence, do you consider that those committee members uh, that did so were in a position to actively participate in the committee's final decision? In considering this point, let me inform the House that at times when I was giving evidence, the committee room was as busy as uh, Flinders Street uh, Railway Station, the rush hour. I am sure that all members would agree that anyone appearing to give evidence before a court of law is entitled to a fair hearing. That is, after all, what natural justice is all about. How would it be, for instance, if a judge of the federal court were to absent himself from the courtroom uh, while the uh, subject of the hearing was given evidence to then reappear to deliver a verdict? 
It would make an absolute mockery of our whole system of justice. Eighthly, are you satisfied that the committee was competent to conduct the inquiry in the terms agreed by the House, given the matters raised by the member Flinders in his dissenting report at paragraph three, subparagraphs B, C, D, and E? Ninthly, I take it the member for uh, the member doesn't want uh, answers to his rhetorical questions now. Not now, no, Mr. Speaker. But I would ask you. To, I would ask you to deliberate and consider these questions. Well, I, I would imagine if the member wished to have uh, the member for Bruce wanted answers to those questions, maybe the proper way would have been to have communicated with me in writing rather than raising them uh, in this debate. He might well, want uh, to, Mr. Uh, he Mr. Might Speaker, at some later date uh, place the matter in writing to me and I'll consider what he has to say. Uh, Mr Speaker, I only have uh, two more no, questions to go and they are part of my, uh, my participation in this important debate and I would seek your leave just to uh, put on the record the remaining few questions that I have. But you have the call. You can. Thank you. Ninthly, are you entirely satisfied that the committee itself in no way breached the Parliamentary Privileges Act, given the point raised by the member Flinders in his dissenting report at paragraph 3, subparagraph H? Ten, uh, tenthly, are you concerned at the matter raised by the member Flinders in his dissenting report at paragraph 3, subparagraph I, that the majority were not prepared to give adequate time to those members of the committee who indicated that they wished to lodge a minority report? Eleventhly, is it the usual practice of the Committee of Privileges to prepare and circulate the outline and substance of the Committee's majority report prior to the subject of the Committee's inquiry completing his or her evidence? In reaching a, a point on this point, Mr Speaker, you and honourable members might uh, like to consider the consequences for the principle of a fair hearing and natural justice if such a practice uh, were to occur in our court system. Thankfully, uh, it doesn't occur here. Only in places like Romania would such practice be considered. Finally, uh, given the very serious matters raised in the dissenting reports and the points I have just raised, I ask you, Mr Speaker, and all honourable members, do you sincerely believe I was accorded natural justice? Mr Speaker, the completion of my grievance speech on the 23rd of November, I sought and was granted leave to table the statutory declaration from which I read. At the time of tabling, no point of order was taken against me. Furthermore, no point of order, Mr Speaker, or other objection was made during my speech or the tabling of the document by the Minister in charge of the House at the time, or for that matter, by any other member present. Additionally, uh, Mr Speaker, the Deputy Speaker in the chair at the time could have examined the document and ruled on whether or not it could be tabled. However, the Deputy Speaker did not prevent me tabling the document. To say that I created difficulties for the chair is therefore not an argument that can be sustained. Mr Speaker, I earlier referred to the gross misrepresentation of what I said on the 23rd of November last by the Minister for the Arts. On this matter, I also seek your advice. Were the gross misrepresentations of my speech by the Minister for the Arts a breach of privilege? Finally, uh, Mr Speaker, as the Committee of Privileges has itself said that it does not have the capacity to conduct an authoritative investigation into the allegation itself. I wish to inform the House that as a result, I will therefore be handing in a notice of motion that will address the issue of the activities of the Yugoslav Secret Service in Australia. The Honourable Minister for the Arts and Territories. Mr Speaker, there is probably no more difficult role for any member of this House, or for any House of Parliament, than to sit upon a Privileges Committee. Because although these committees fortunately meet rarely, they are entrusted with very difficult tasks and they have to face, in this particular case, the difficult task of judging one of their colleagues, affording him the benefit of the doubt and trying to fulfil the obligations which the House itself, by deliberative vote, had referred to it. It's a matter of deep regret for me that the honourable member for Menzies chose to use terms which, in my view, in describing the activities of the committee as a star chamber, were not merely jaundiced, coloured, but were an essentially an intemperate exercise in legal obfuscation. So let's go to the issues of the day. Let's see how these matters arose and what are the matters that the now House now has to determine? 
I find it strange, and indeed I find it difficult to comprehend, that the honourable member for Bruce now says that I had not only misrepresented but obviously grievously misrepresented his allegations in the House concerning the honourable member for Hotham. Let's look to the statements made by the honourable member to see whether, in fact, one could reasonably deduce that I, in fact, had either innocently or deliberately misrepresented his position. The honourable gentleman at page 2805 of Hansard speaks of the activities of the Yugoslav Secret Service in Melbourne. And he says, uh, he's going to quote uh, from an affidavit, and he says, I've interviewed both the person who'd sworn the affidavit and his informant at length about the contents of the document that I'm about to read. Now, weigh that heavily. This is not a, a statement by, by an honourable member saying, well, look, I, I found an affidavit and it fell off a truck and uh, I'm not certain whether it's uh, true or false, but nevertheless, in, as a matter of public interest, I feel I ought to read it out. That's not the situation at all. What we were assured by the honourable gentleman was that he had spoken to both these informants. He was satisfied of their veracity. He referred to the person who swore it as a prominent and respected identity of the Melbourne Croatian community. Now, one is asked, one is, I believe, able to ask the House, well, does the honourable member, does the honourable member uh, for Bruce adopt the statements as being true or being false? If they were false, he should not have adopted them. But he then proceeded to read them out. And what does the affidavit say? It says that the activities of the SDB or the Yugoslav Secret Service is, a, is apparent it talks of people living in fear, fear of physical violence and indeed of death. The allegation is that a certain official of the M Yugoslav Embassy uh, was an agent of the Yugoslav Secret Service. And then at the very last moment, the point at which the honourable gentleman resumes his seat is to make the specific allegation that the person who was connected with that Yugoslav agent was the honourable member for Hoffman. Now, I was the duty minister at the earlier part of the Honourable Member's speech, and he was making allegations about some Yugoslav organisation. And I then left the House, and I believe that what then occurred, I mean, there were difficulties for the chair, uh, there was an exchange of ministers on duty, as the Honourable Member hadn't reached this part of his evidence. And when he says uh, he'd tabled the document, he'd already read the document out. The damage had already been done. And uh, it's already been suggested, and properly so, that there are ample precedents where the House or the Chair may be in error by virtue of a set of circumstances that occurs in the House. It's, open, it's open to the House. Order, the Honourable Member for Point Bruce. of order, on, on a matter of fact, uh, Mr Speaker, Mr West uh, uh, was present throughout my entire There's speech. There's no point of order. The Honourable <laughs> Minister. To correct that. So, if some two and a half hours later, when I raise the nature of the allegations made by the honourable gentleman, and I repeat the basis of the head of privilege under which I raised them, that if they were true, then the honourable member for Hotham could not adequately and properly discharge his duties as a member of this house. And that, and that is clearly a head of privilege, and that argument was accepted unanimously by the house. Unanimously. And let me say this. If I misrepresented the Honourable Member for Bruce, why did he not raise in his place on that occasion to say that I had misrepresented him? That was not his intention. It, there was a mistake being made. He had never intended to suggest what was implied. Uh, and I made it quite clear. He was clearly indicating that, in his view, the Honourable Member for Hotham was involved in activities with the Yugoslav secret police. The honourable member for, for Bruce in fact rose in the House 
He had enough parliamentary opportunity. But did he rise to say that I had misrepresented his position? Not a bit of it. If you look at Hansard, he rose in order to see if he could lodge another affidavit. That's what occurred. Now let me deal with the proceedings of the committee and the intemperate, oh, no. and the intemperate, suggest uh, the intemperate statements made that somehow this committee acted as a star chamber. Let me say this, that I believe the majority of members of this committee and who wrote this report gave it a great deal of time, probably a great deal more time than it, that it deserved, having regard for the general attitude that the honourable member for Aldred adopted towards the members of the committee. Because, you see, when you examine the transcript, when you examine the transcript, what honourable members might not be aware of, the committee decided as a matter of discretion, as it was open to it, not because it was a right for the honourable member for Hotham, they decided as a matter of discretion, if he wanted the assistance of uh, his legally trained colleague, the honourable member for Benighton, that would be available to him. Stuart. But if what we are doing... Order, the yes. Minister oh, I'm sorry, the honourable member for Sturt. And if what we are doing is saying, well now, we must adopt the processes that we see in our courts, because the honourable member is very keen on the processes as they occur in our courts. I spent some 17 years in various courts in this land. I have never seen a process where when you ask, as we ask the honourable member for Hopper, how long have you been a member of this house? There is wink, wink, nod, nod, a conversation with his legal adviser, and after some uh, 30 seconds, well, three quarters of a minute, he then proceeds to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, one asks him what is a fairly simple question with which I would have thought any, any honourable member who's try, trying to deal with, some, uh, with, with a candid response to his parliamentary colleagues to resolve this matter, when you say to him, do you understand the standing orders? It's wink, wink, nod, nod, more consultation, and after about another 30 seconds, the answer is yes. <laughs> and then when you say to the honourable member, well, and it's absolutely germane, what was his intention when he came in with this affidavit? Did you intend uh, to damage the honourable member for Hotham? We could have got a candid yes or no, but wink, wink. Nod, nod. Um, and the answer then comes no. <laughs> and then when you say, well, what did you intend to do? Wink, wink. Nod, nod. A much longer period of consultation. I don't believe I should answer that question. <laughs> and you see, it's not as if this committee didn't give the honourable gentleman every opportunity. You see, it's not just the honourable gentleman that's on trial here today. And he's not on trial. He's being asked to comply with the standing orders. He's to be asked if he'll behave with some sense of honour in terms of this parliament and this institution. It is this institution, it is members of the opposition who are as much on trial as members of the government. Because, you see, if you want to support the honourable member for Hotham in his suggestions that somehow, or Bruce, the honourable member for Bruce, that somehow he has been grievously misunderstood and badly treated, that he didn't really intend to say all these things, then the first thing you've got to ask yourself, as an intelligent politician, and there are a few of them in this chamber, was it an accident? Was it an accident on the very same day in a matter of hours his parliamentary colleague from Victoria, Senator Short, in another place, is making precisely the same allegation and he can't proceed with it because it was contrary to the standing orders of the Senate. Have a look at the Senate debate. Have a look at the attempt that was made there. And you are invited to believe that that was somehow a political coincidence. Well, uh, in case we should have misjudged uh, the honourable member and not giving him an opportunity, it was brought to the attention of members of the committee because there aren't many secrets in this parliamentary institution. It was suggested 
to members of the committee that members of the press gallery have been informed prior to this gentleman making his speech that uh, they ought to be present because he was really going to give uh, the treatment to the honourable member for Hotham. Now, is that a fact or isn't it? Because, you see, it goes to the question of intent. If it was never his intent to do damage to the honourable member for Hotham, then it couldn't possibly be true that he would be approaching a member of the press gallery uh, to suggest that he was going to, to use the terms of the honourable member for Wide Bay, drop a bucket. Well, what more can you do to try and establish the innocence or otherwise of this honourable gentleman? And in the, if you look at the transcript at page 50, the question is put very simply and very directly. And I put it, and I put it on the basis that it might be to his benefit. It would be to your benefit, would it not, if it were totally untrue that you had approached a member of the press or members of the press prior to making your speech to inform them that you were going to attack the member for Hotham, would it not be to your benefit if that were totally untrue to deny it here and now? To deny it here and now? And I say to Honourable gentleman opposite, if in fact that was totally untrue, it was just one of the rumours that run around this place, wouldn't it have been of advantage to the Honourable Member to say there's not a skerrick of truth in it? And have a look at the Honourable Gentleman's answer. He was not prepared to deny on oath the veracity of that allegation. So I believe the conclusion that was reached, and I condemn the statement of the Honourable Member for Menzies who said that a member of the committee had drafted a resolution virtually to prejudge it. What you forgot to say, what you forgot to say was that the member who drafted that resolution was not a member of the government or a supporter of the government. He was one of the most highly respected members of this House and the candidate of the opposition for the position of deputy chairman of this House. Oh, well, I, I, I believe it's nonpartisan, but you're not going to walk in here and accuse members of this committee of, of running a star chamber, accuse in a general way a member of the committee, hoping that people will reasonably believe that that was a, a somehow a scurrilous exercise which was devised by a supporter or a member of the government. It was, it was, a, it was, a, it was an imputation that you're entitled to withdraw. So, you see, when it comes Order. down to the, the question, Menzies will cease interjecting. when it comes the down, the member Menzies will cease interjecting. When it comes down to the issue before this house, it's really very simple. It's do were members of the committee entitled to form the view that the honourable member did not intend to damage the member for Hotham, and the members of the committee have clearly reached a view about that. So, on the basis of all the evidence, if he was subject to misrepresentation, as he now says he was, he had several parliamentary opportunities to rectify that, but he chose not to do so. Now, if you're an experienced Order. Member of Parliament yeah. and you're being Member's misrepresented... Time. Order. The Minister's time has expired. I have asked leave to make a personal explanation, but not necessarily now if this is not a time convenient to you, but simply to we raise it at the first possible opportunity. We might do it after this matter is discharged. The Honourable Member for New England. Mr Speaker, this is a House of Parliament, not a court of law. Over the last hour, we have heard attacks on the Member for Hotham, we have heard attacks on the Honourable Member for Bruce. I would suggest to all of those participating in this debate that this is not the function of this House. This House is a place where properly, if there are issues that reflect against the integrity of an individual, they can't be resolved here. If they are, they're going to be resolved on a political basis. And I suggest, therefore, the first thing we need to do is to set aside something of the hypocrisy and pomposity we've just heard from the Minister for the Arts and address what are 
significantly the powers and responsibilities of the parliament when it comes to a matter of privilege. I find myself totally opposed to the report. I'm opposed on three bases. The first is that I believe that this finding, were it to be reached, is one that should be given by the Speaker of the House or he or she who acts on your behalf. If it were to be accepted by this House, indeed, I think it goes almost as a reflection against the Chair. In the Chair has not acted as the standing orders give them capacity to. In the nature of the findings, as my friend and colleague, the Honourable Member for Wide Bay said, is that the Honourable Member for Bruce has in fact abused the forms of the House. Now the custodian of the forms of the House is you, Mr Speaker, and if there's a breach of the forms of the House, and if the committee has found there's abuse of the forms of the House, what they're doing is saying that you are derelict in your duty. So what the committee is doing, they've said there's no breach of privilege, what they're doing is say that you are not fulfilling your responsibility. That it is you who are at fault. I'm not used to sitting here, I'm afraid. It is you and not well, the, the parliament itself. The, me the member for New England also to, better be careful he doesn't reflect upon the chair. Well, I'm just suggesting the committee itself does, Mr Speaker, and that's my concern. That the committee, in fact, I'll in reaching a conclusion, it has said there's no breach of privilege, there is an abuse of the forms of the House, and you, as the custodian of the forms of the House, are the one who, therefore, in some ways, is derelict in your duty. And I'd far be it for me to suggest that you should ever be that. <laughs> the well, third I appreciate concern, those sentiments from the member for New England. The third concern that I have, Mr. Speaker, I suppose, is that in the reference and in the first paragraph of the report, we see that. The reference to the resolution was passed on the 23rd of November in this place. What we should have done at that stage, and as I said when I raised a point of order at the time, has allowed you to consider the matter rather than to rush straight into the resolution. Had we done so, you might well have come out with a report that we're now considering. Had you done so, that would have been at a different basis altogether. But it concerns me that what instead has happened has indeed has so properly been identified in the two dissenting reports to the report, is that the committee has been called on to examine matters which, while in your hands are matters which I can well understand might cause concern, are matters which have been distorted. Now, as to the findings themselves, I also have problems in the way that they have been reached. I find that the nature of an abuse of the forms of the House seems to be because there's been a statutory declaration tabled. Now, I'm not too sure that uh, statutory declarations have any great consequence, although, of course, they are attested, and the people who make them normally accept the consequences of their having not only put their name to that statutory declaration, but they've had their name attested, sometimes by a justice of the peace and sometimes by some or other authority. So what we're really saying, and I think that my honourable colleague, the member for Wide Bay, was suggesting that statutory declarations in some way are matters which should not be used and should certainly should not be used in this place. Now, if they are used, they can only be used if they are tabled by consent. Now, we know that you've got to seek leave, and we know in this instance the minister who was at the table at the time gave leave. Now, it concerns me that apparently his action in giving leave has not been apparently considered by the Committee of Privileges. And yet, if somebody has abused the forms of the House, then the person who is the in standing in place of the Prime Minister at any time, as the Minister in charge of the House, is the person who should care for the government's interests. And in this instance, while it was possible for him to disagree, he did not do so. Now, I disagree with the Honourable Member Bruce in suggesting the Deputy Speaker could have looked at the document. It's not for the Speaker or the Deputy Speaker to determine whether or not in the statute of declaration, at least in the first instance, there is something that uh, is against the forms of the House until it is read. When it is read, he has a capacity to identify it. But in the normal course of events, once somebody in the in the parliament seeks to table something, then it's up to the minister in charge of the House at the time to determine whether or not it's acceptable. When it is read, then of course it becomes the responsibility. One voice, all right, one voice. But when it is read, then of course it's the person who is the speaker. So my concern, secondly, is very much that within the nature 
of the proceedings of this place, that there should have been action taken at the time, and it is not peculiarly the member for Bruce who has transcended the standing orders of this place. It is the minister, and query whether or not in its findings there has not been a reflection on the person sitting in the speaker's chair who, when the matters were read, did not identify the fact as requiring a substantive motion. Now, when I spoke prior to the resolution in the parliament, Mr Speaker, I said, as I would again now, that privilege is a very important function of this House. It concerns me that in accepting, as no doubt on the basis of the government's endorsement of this report, it will, this House is going to give to the Committee of Privileges powers that certainly were not, I think, thought to be the powers of the Committee of Privileges when the matter was debated and the parliamentary privileges legislation was passed through this place. Indeed, as I recall it, uh, there was quite a significant debate in this House, and that Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987 codified our requirements as to how privileges should be debated, how the committee should be concerned, and uh, I suspect that the nature of this finding, which is going to go down on record, is going to extend the power of that Privileges Committee in a way that I don't think the Act itself envisaged, nor do I think is in the best interests of this chamber. I think it's also important that we understand that as far as uh, the findings of the report, there have been very serious allegations made about some aspects relating to the committee's deliberations. As I am not a member of the committee, I cannot speak to them, but I certainly express my concern that uh, in uh, the uh, dissenting report of the honourable member for Flinders, that paragraph H seems to me to raise very serious matters as to the conduct of the affairs of the Committee of Privileges. From this, Mr Speaker, it seems to me that again it reiterates the fact that if there is to be a reference on privilege, it must be done very seriously, it must be done after proper consideration, and I would suggest it would have been far better had the conclusions that are now presented to us come from the Speaker rather than from a committee, certainly in circumstances where the deliberations of that committee are in question. I find it really quite remarkable that we've had some of the contributions we've had today. I found that, uh, for example, the Honourable Member for McEwen in attacking the Honourable Member for Bruce, I don't believe that this is a forum where the Honourable Member for Bruce is under attack for his views of the past. Sure, the findings of the report relate to his abuse of the forms of the House, and uh, we heard from the Minister of the Arts how it was all a matter of intent. Well, once you get down to matter of intent, I'd suggest you really are getting down to the legal processes. And because this is not a place where the legal processes should be pursued, I'd suggest that that was all irrelevant. Indeed, I thought that uh, the Minister for a while had got uh, a bit too locked up in reading uh, Enid Blyton to his children with his wink, wink, nod, nod, and all that went with that. But, Mr Speaker, there is another part of this report to which I want to address for a moment, and that's the penalty. I suppose of all the findings of this place, the one that's had, and that is of the Parliament of Australia, that's had as much uh, notoriety as any other, with the conclusions reached with Brown against Brown and Fitzpatrick so long ago. Now, I don't want this deliberation today to finish in the same order. It might well be that the members should be reprimanded. It might well be that uh, the conclusion, which is in the last part of the paragraph C of the committee's report, and recommends the honourable member apologise, that that is an appropriate course. But that not really is what we're talking about now. We're talking about a suspension for two days. I find it quite incredible this non-legal forum is finding itself in a position where arbitrarily, at the whim of the government, we're to have a penalty imposed on one of its members, not after some proper consideration. How do we reach two days? I mean, why not 20 days? Why not 20 months? I mean, there are all sorts of prejudices that I know that emerge about other members of this place and how long people should be from wherever. I find that the nature of the penalty and the recommendations of the penalty also reflect the discredit of this House. I don't see that we are capable of deciding it's an appropriate penalty the two days uh, suspension be the, the proper 
conclusion to the member failing to apologise. I mean, I just find that uh, totally unrelated to the nature of the alleged crime. I mean, sure, there's been an abuse of the forms of the House, but as I've suggested, the Minister of the Table was party to that. And I'd suggest, with due respect, Mr Speaker, in the findings of the committee, there's an implication that the chair itself in some way might have been involved. So how can it be that one of those three participants, the member himself, is going to be suspended for two days, but everybody else let go scot-free? Indeed, the honourable member for McEwen was referring a while ago to the publicity accorded in the Melbourne papers. As I recall, the publicity was really for the statement from the Minister for the Arts rather than for the member for Bruce. Now, if you're going to start looking at who said what and who's reported where, the Minister of the Arts is culpable, for it was his comments as much as any others that were reported in the media. So let's be honest with ourselves. I mean, two days suspension. What's the basis of coming to this sort of a penalty? We really are having ourselves on. I mean, all this false piety and sudden uh, judicial merit in being able to determine that somebody's been nasty and said terrible things to each other. Look, for goodness sake, this is a political forum. We're in the rundown to election and the Labor Party is going to be defeated. We're going to say horrific things about each other in the next few months. We all know that, but come off it. Don't let's carry on and believe that somehow, because we're in government, we know that this man's a terrible fellow. We don't agree with all those things we've, he said, so we're going to give him two days suspension. Really, I think it's absolute arrant nonsense. And what it does is bring this parliament into disrepute. And that's my concern, Mr Speaker. That was the reason why when the matter was first canvassed, I raised a point of order and suggested order. that the it would be a very good idea if the Speaker considered the issue. Because I don't believe privilege is something that should be just cast lightly aside. I don't believe it's a matter where we are or can be in a position of judging right or wrong. I mean, I make no judgment whatsoever about the individual attitudes of members of this place on a whole range of issues where I have very strong views contrary to theirs. And we're all the same. But what we're doing is we're not only coming to a conclusion that the standing orders haven't been followed, we're going to suspend one of the party and only one of the parties responsible to two days absence from this place because of it. Now, Mr Speaker, I think what it does is really reflects against this House. When we come to a conclusion that's a non sequitur, it comes to a conclusion that shows that somehow we're purporting to be a house of law. Somehow we're going to reach a judgment which is beyond our capacity. I don't find the penalty fits the crime, and I'm quite sure Gilbert and Sullivan alive would make a tremendous musical opera of the whole jolly scene. The Honourable the Minister, the question is that the motion be put. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. no I think the no, ayes have it. No, 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 no. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the question be now put. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Macmillan and Streeton. Tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Wannan and Riverina Darling. Tell us for the nose. The honourable member for Hume on a point of order. not uh, in the chair's position to give advice to members. <laughs> but if the member for Hume wants to consult me later, I'll uh, talk to him.
order. The result of the division is ayes 75, noes 50. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Streeton and McMillan tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Wannan and Riverina Darling tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 76, noes 49. In accordance with the resolution, I, therefore the division is resolved in the affirmative. In accordance with the resolution just passed by the House, I call on the honourable member for Bruce to withdraw the allegation and apologise to the House. For the reasons I have stated earlier, Mr. Speaker, I decline to do so. The honourable minister. Uh, in the light of that, Mr. Speaker, I move that the honourable member for Bruce be suspended from the service of the House for two sitting days, including today. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I move the motion be put. Oh, the question is that the motion be put. All those with that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Order. The member for O'Connor. The member for Menzies will cease interjecting. Lock the doors. The question is that the question be now put. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Street and McMillan tell us for the ayes, the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina Darling tell us for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 78, noes 52. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. All those with that opinion please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Street and the Macmillan tell us for the ayes, the honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wannan tell us for the noes. The Honourable Member for Herbert. Order. The result of the division is ayes 78, noes 54. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. And the honourable member for Bruce is suspended from the service of the House for two sitting days, including today. <coughs> Order. The honourable member for Bruce should leave the chamber. The clerk with petitions. Petitions from certain citizens have been lodged as follows: by the members for Indy, McKellar, McEwen, Wills, Griffith, seat. Fraser, Herbert. Hind Marsh and Eden Monero from 69, 40, 80, 28, 13, 43, 18, 185 and 270 petitioners respectively. Praying that policies be implemented to increase Australian aid, fight poverty, protect the environment and promote human rights. By the members for Bruce Holt, Werriwa, Kuyong and Cunningham from 110, 24, 20, 74 and 20 petitioners respectively, praying that funding of abortions through Medicare cease and certain other action be taken to protect the right to life of the unborn. By the members for Bruce, Bendigo, Maribyrnong and Goldstein from 14, 43, 23 and 61 petitioners respectively, 
praying that the national flag not be changed except by a referendum. By the members for Indi, McEwen, McMillan and Holt from 309, 999, 121 and 73 petitioners respectively, praying that the abortion funding abolition bill be supported. By the members for Sydney, Wide Bay and Ryan from 1370 and nine petitioners respectively, praying that an international earth repair action decade begin on 5 June 1990. By the members for Charlton, Petrie and Hindmarsh from 31, 18 and 72 petitioners respectively, praying that support for the capital gains tax be maintained. By the members for Deakin and Goldstone from 178 and 10 petitioners, praying that proposed legislation which would require companies to assess their taxable income within 15 days of the end of a financial year not be passed. By the members for Richmond and Parks from 973 and 1,128 petitioners, praying that the emphasis on monetary policy be replaced by a lower government expenditure, microeconomic restructuring and reform of the taxation system. By the member for Deakin from 121 petitioners, praying that the excessive reliance on high interest rates cease. By the member for Benathan from 75 petitioners, praying that all advertising of alcohol on radio and television be banned. By the member for Richmond from 17 petitioners, praying the provision of an adequately funded pharmaceutical benefits scheme, which ensures availability of pharmaceutical benefits through local pharmacies, be guaranteed. By the member for Bradfield from 59 petitioners, praying the restructuring of the pharmaceutical benefits scheme be reconsidered. By the member for Macmillan from 124 electors of the Division of Macmillan, praying that a breast x ray program for Australian women be implemented as soon as possible. By the member for Maribyrnong from 15 petitioners, praying that action be taken to amend laws which permit discrimination on the basis of age. By the member for Maribyrnong from 11 petitioners, praying that the dedication of the teaching profession, its interest in the welfare of its students and its loyalty to the community be recognised. By the member for Melbourne Ports from 102 petitioners, praying that action be taken to phase out the consumption, production and export of chlorofluorocarbons and halons. By the member for Benelong from 420 petitioners, praying that steps be taken to maintain both high quality health care for the community and equity for community pharmacists. By the member for Gilmore from 273 petitioners, praying that the allocation to roads from fuel excise revenue be increased by 10 cents per litre from existing taxes and continue at that level for the next decade with adjustments for changes in fuel prices. By the member for Moncrief from 12 petitioners, praying that legislative action be taken to encourage the use of recycled materials, minimise the use of new materials and prevent the generation of toxic wastes. By the member for O'Connor from 181 petitioners, praying the continued viability of neighbourhood pharmaceutical services be guaranteed by an adequately funded pharmaceutical benefits scheme. By the member for Lowe from 191 petitioners, praying the abortion funding abolition bill be debated and voted upon during the current sittings of the House. By the member for Lowe from 60 petitioners, praying that certain action be taken to ensure the viability of community pharmacists. The terms of the various petitions will be recorded in Hansard and copies referred to the appropriate ministers. The chair will be resumed at 2 p.m. I, I, yeah, I might 